Friday, and you're listening to the Russell and Mud Thieves Show right here on the Radio Random Network. Before we get into having all the fun today, I just want to remind everybody that today's show is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash RDM. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Audibletrial.com forward slash RDM. Now it's time for the show. From the Bayou State of Louisiana, this is Hashtag RDM Russell Devin McLean. All right, welcome to another exciting episode of Radio Random Network's Russell and Mudtooth Show. Now, Mudtooth's not here this week, but no problem, because I'm joined by Mr. Will I Am Taylor Made. Thank you. Thank you, Russell, for, <laughs> and for letting me sit in today. I appreciate it. Not a problem. And the real estate lady, Miss Tanya Halford. Hello. Thank you for tuning in on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, or wherever you're listening to us from. Tonight we got a special guest, and she's already on the line. I'm talking to Miss Sarah Lane. How you doing, Sarah? Hi, I'm good. How are you? We're doing great. We're doing great. So you're in California. Real quick, how's the weather in California? It's been pretty good. I was in New York during the El Nino storm, so I kind of missed out on that, which is a good thing. But, yeah, today's been beautiful. It's 60, 62 degrees. Yes, I indeed. think that's about what it was here today. Was it? That's awesome. Now, Sarah, is you got a brand-new movie coming out. Um, it's going to be yeah. out with uh, January 29th. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost... It's something that um, we was we we googled you as we do all of our uh, guests here. Uh, you was in a uh, where where is she from, Tanya? You got the information. Um, on there? She's she's from um, Thailand. She was born in Guam, though. Right, right. So, but but you were in there soap opera in in, in Thailand, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's right. I'm I'm half Thai. My mom is Thai. Cool. Cool. So, you know, that just struck me as crazy. I mean, you never think about any, uh, you know, any other country having soap operas like Days of Our Lives or anything like that. So give us a little insight on, on what it was like to be on a, uh, you know, a soap opera. I mean, I, I did it a lot as a, as a teenager. Um, so I would, you know, go to school and then right after school I'd go to the set. Um, it, was, you know, it, was, it was a super fun experience. I was doing what I loved and you know, not getting into trouble because I was working all the time. And, um, yeah, I was, I was making money. I was able to save up a lot of money and just just do some really cool stuff because when you're 14, 15, and you're running around chasing after a goat that's your aunt, you know, that's, that's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, I mean, so you, you were a teenager. You, you, you're, you're, on so, it was, you're on soap operas at a young age now. It, did you start? Yeah. I mean, did you start acting at at an early age? Yeah, I did. I started doing um, commercials, and then um, I moved on to the soap operas. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. That's cool. So, um, I mean, what, what was the age you started acting? Um, I mean, I really started doing the commercials at around twelve, thirteen. Cool, cool. So, I mean, is that is that something? I mean, uh, entertainment business and, and and acting and everything is that something that uh, you're familiar? I mean, that ran in your family? Uh, are you the only one? Um, yeah, I ran. Um, and my mother's my mother's side. Um, her family is in the media. They were like in radio and TV. Um, and then my on my dad's side, my uncle is a big theater guy. So yeah, it kind of it didn't run in my direct family like my parents. We're not into it, um, but definitely the extended family. Awesome, that is awesome. So, so, so then I mean, we, we want to fast forward to now. You're you're in Los Angeles, correct? Yes, I am. Now, was that a culture shock coming from, uh, you know, Thailand to to California? Yeah, it really, it really was. I mean, I I was always like fascinated by America, not not just not just California. Yeah, you know, I I would like read a lot of books about America and watch all the shows there. So I was super excited to come for the first time, and it was it was just nuts. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, as you was growing up and, and everything, I mean, it, who was some of your um, I guess inspirations or, or some some people in the uh, the the film industry that you looked up to? I mean, I there are so many actresses I always love, like Charlie Theron. Um, I watched a lot of Friends, so obviously, like, all the Friends cast. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I've always, always just loved movies and TV. I love Kate Blanchett. Um, yeah, so, so many actresses. Like, I, I always just wanted to come to America and, and, and be a part of the culture and, um, yeah, just, Leave Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. He was also in a movie, a film called Jurassic City. Give us a little insight on that. Yes, I was. That was just a small cameo role. Um, I am in a hot tub, and um, mm. a dinosaur approaches me. And yeah, I, I won't spoil it for you all, but so it's kind of a it's kind of a spinoff of the Jurassic Park movies, and is that what it was? Or? Yes. Yeah, no, I love I love the dinosaur movies. I actually did two dinosaur movies. One I shot in Montana, um, which is really fun, and the Jurassic City was shot in L.A. But your first movie in L.A. was with uh, Steven Seagal, right? With uh, Belly of the Beast, you played his daughter. Yes, that was the first movie I ever like the first American movie I ever did. But that was actually shot in Thailand. Now, how was it working? Uh, how was that experience working with the international man of myth, uh, international man of mystery, Mr. Steven Seagal? Yeah, I mean, I was I was super nervous. I I was super young. It was my first big movie, and um, he's really big and intimidating. And I, you know, I was super scared. But it, yeah, it was it was a great experience. I actually didn't interact with him that much because the movie is is me um, being kidnapped and held for ransom, and then he's chasing after me and trying to rescue me. So we really were kind of apart throughout the whole movie. But yeah, it was it was such a great experience. That, the first big thing I ever booked, you know, I auditioned for it. I went for the call back. I was waiting to hear back. And, and, you know, when I got that call, it was just like, wow, you just don't believe it, you know. Yes, indeed. Well, that that's pretty awesome. So uh, you got a new movie that's going to be coming out. Um... Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. Is that out yet? Yeah, that came out. Um, yeah, that already came out. Um, the new movie is uh, Wishing for a Dream that's coming out on the 29th. Okay. Yes, indeed. And then, now, is that the one? Uh, I think uh, is it directed by uh, Jared Kahn? Is it correct? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I had Jared. Jared's actually been on the show uh, a few months back. Actually, he was he was here with us. But uh, what was it like? What was the experience like working with Jared? It was great. I mean, we we worked together before. Um, you know, he's super good at what he does. He's really professional. Um, he's also a writer, and he used to be an actor, and he still acts. So you know, he understands every every part of the filmmaking process. So, yeah, it was, it, was, it was super fun. That's awesome. That is awesome. So, I mean, let's get away from the movie thing. I guess we'll make it a little bit more mm-hmm. uh, personable. I mean, what do you do in your spare time when you're not working? I, I'm working all the time, pretty much. I, I, very, I barely have, you know, any time off um, because it's just crazy. You're just always on the go when you're in this industry. You can't turn down any little opportunity. So I'm pretty much always working, but... Um, if I'm not, I really, um, I love movies, TV, obviously, you know, I love watching shows. Um, I love reading yoga. Um, I've been really into uh, boxing recently. Um, so yeah, just, it's just keeping fit and, um, Yes, indeed. Yeah, there's just not a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're talking about, you've been into boxing here lately. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be, uh, you're in the starring role of the upcoming, uh, featured film, uh, Kickboxer Vengeance. Yes. You, yes, that's going to be amazing. I'm super excited about that. Yes, indeed. Are you? You're, I think you're going to be uh, your role. You're playing an actress that's uh, contending with uh, exhaustion. Oh, that's that's wishing for a dream. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> they got our notes wrong here. I I do apologize. That's the second part oh, no, on no, me tonight. No. But uh, well, tell us a little bit about. It. I mean, uh, how are you preparing for this role, uh, uh, Kickboxer Vengeance? For Kickboxer. Um, I, you know, I had to speak Thai in the movie. I play like a half Thai person. So, you know, I do speak Thai fluently, but, you know, it was just really important for me. It's a little rusty. I don't speak Thai every day like I used to. So um, a lot of the preparation was, you know, the Thai lines, getting it right, right getting the accent right. Um, I play a, a cop in the movie. So, you know, there was a lot of training, weapon training, um, you know, how to use handcuffs and arrest people and stuff like that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Now, have you have you watched any of the? Uh, have you been any watching any like uh, Holly Holmes or Ronda Rousey or or any MMA or anything like that to get prepared? Oh yeah, yeah, huge huge fan of the UFC. Um, yeah, I lo- I I watched that epic fight where um, Holly Holmes knocked Ronda out. Um, yeah, I, I love. I love watching the fight. That broke my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was terrible, 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 but. 
Yeah, I also watched the recent one where Weidman got got really beat. Um, Chris Weidman, did you see that? You said you like uh, mm-hmm. yoga and reading and uh, boxing. Yes. You want to stay in fit. It yes. sounds like you are uh, uh, going all out with the uh, mental and, and and physical part of uh, what's your routine look like on a daily basis. That uh, how do you fit in the yoga and the boxing and, and reading with um, all your acting and things that's going on with you. I mean, I really, I try to get stuff done super early in the morning. Like, I feel like if I get my workout done in the morning, then whatever happens in the day, um, at least I've done that, you know. So um, I try to schedule that for, like, super early. I'm usually up really early. Luckily, I have a yoga studio, like, right right by where I live, so I can ride my bike there. Um, So that's always nice. And, yeah, I mean, the thing is, with this industry and, and doing what, what I do there's just no routine like you just never know what's going to happen yeah. next every day is like some big adventure like you know last year I, I remember this time last year I was like on a plane to Mississippi you know and I had like two days to prepare um again I could be in New York this weekend like who knows everything you just constantly have to be prepared for everything and, and nothing I mean then it could go completely quiet and I could do yoga all day um, right. And just waiting for a phone call, you know, so it's just you just have to try and like keep calm and just keep your mind in a good place and just be just be prepared and really fluid for anything to happen. And if nothing happens, then to really, you know, occupy yourself, don't get anxious, you know, which is obviously like all the, the reading and the yoga and everything helps with that aspect. Yeah, that's uh, uh, one of the things that I found that uh, like uh, people that are really active and that are uh, keep themselves going they start early in the mornings and 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 do the things uh like yoga and stretching and uh boxing and exercising and things in the morning so that was just one of the questions yeah. that i had uh not to interrupt y'all but no 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 go sorry, ahead go you're part of it too you can ask her anything <laughs> so i mean you're getting up early and just over the whiskey go-go and the strip over there that that's that completely out huh you, you no nope, no partying for you <laughs> Well, she didn't say yes or no. no. <laughs> oh wait, were you asking me the question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you. I, I didn't. I thought you were asking him. <laughs> he wait, said I didn't, it, I didn't it's all. Like, it's all work, no topic. play. All work, no play for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. I mean, I, I do try to fit in a little play here and there. Oh, you do. But, okay. Uh, See, that's that's the, that's the good stuff. That's that's what we want to talk about. I mean, you got the movies. We'll promote the <laughs> movies and everything. But I mean, what, what's your favorite spot? I mean, you're in L.A. I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, where, where, where do you go party? Um. Oh my God. Actually, was <laughs> I was in New York for um, New Year's Eve, and I went to the most incredible party. It was it was in a secret location. Like I had to take a bus to this secret location. We weren't told where the address was. We were just told like a meeting point. Um, and the party was like held in this huge mansion and everybody was wearing like masks and costumes. Mm. It was, it was incredible. And it was all like done like secretly online. Uh, it was one of the best parties I've ever been to. But that was in New York. Um, in LA, you know, Hollywood's always great. There's always some great events and bars, um, in, in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, you know, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't really drink that much, um, Pretty, pretty boring. You don't have to drink to have a good time. No, you could sit in the corner and watch the drunks fall around and laugh at that. How do you uh, get invitations enough. invitations to these secret parties? Yeah, <laughs> um, it was it was to a friend. Um, he's he's been to a couple of them before. It's kind of like a referral kind of thing. Like you only get an invite if you know someone who's right. already been. Um, I just had that yeah, ask. It, it, it sounds cool. Fun. I don't like and get it ever <laughs> invitations to secret parties. <laughs> I yeah. got them before. I mean, they was it was one of them swinger conventions, what? but I mean, I mean that's a little different. Uh, but I mean, it didn't. That sounds like the beginning of a horror movie. Whenever you're, uh, <laughs> you don't know where you're at. You have to take a was it kind of scary, or, or was you excited? I mean, the thought did cross my mind that you know this definitely feels like a, a, a movie. Um, All those horror movies she's but, done kind of come into play. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's New Year's Eve. Everybody seemed to be having a really good time. You know, if we, if we were going to be all, like, murdered by an ex-murderer, like, it would have happened probably pretty soon. I would, probably would have been, like, the first or second kill. And, and after that, like, when that didn't happen, we made it past midnight. You know, it was just a good time. Yes, indeed. It's all fun and games until Peter Crocker shows up. <laughs> 
<laughs> with, yep. with, with that said, so you went up to New York. I, I, I mean, going to New York, I mean, what's that like? I mean, New York's a little bit kind of a different uh, atmosphere than California, I'm sure. But, uh, I mean, what, what's, the, mm-hmm. what's the experience? What's the people like there? Um, it's, it's, it is very different. California is very laid back. Everybody's a little more relaxed. In New York, everybody's very aggressive. Um, I think it's cold there, so I don't know. They seem angrier. Yeah, everybody's um. upset. Pissed off. Pissed off. Yeah, everybody's a lot just edgier. Everybody's more on edge. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's kind of weird. Now, I, going back to your, uh, I guess your your profession, your acting profession, and everything. I mean, mm-hmm. what what are you, what are you, what are your some of your goals? Can you share some of your goals with us that uh, maybe you uh, you're trying to uh, or really that you're trying to do, accomplish? I would love to do some more TV. I've done a lot of. A lot of movies, a lot of independent movies, and um, I, I just haven't had much good opportunity with TV, so I'm really hoping to do some of that this year. Yes, indeed. That's awesome. Well, Sarah, before yeah. I let you go here, and, and we've had a good time, mm-hmm. and I want to encourage everybody, um, the, I think the uh, the show, um, what was the name of the movie? Walking, uh, Walking for a Dream? L- yes. It's going to be out on VOD, I think, January 29th. I encourage everybody to get out yes, there and uh, check it out. I think it's going to be on... Uh, all the uh, the the major in demand streaming networks uh, will be carrying it, and uh, with that said, uh, do you have any advice for for maybe anybody that that, that would, would want to follow in your footsteps? I would, if you do want to start, start young, because the more experience you have under your belt, you know, it's better. I'm really glad I started as a as a kid, um, and just you just have to grow a thick skin and be prepared to be rejected every day, and and just keep going. You know, persist. I, I have one question. Go ahead. Um, mm-hmm. Tanya just showed me uh, the kickboxer Vengeance. Mm-hmm. Did yeah. you get to meet George St. Pierre, GSP? Jean Claude Van Damme. I did. Didn't they? Um, can you tell me a little bit about GSP? Because that's one of my people. That's what <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> GSP is amazing. I actually, um, maybe seven or eight years ago, I actually watched him live um, in a fight in, in Minnesota, actually. Um, and then when I found out I was going to be in a movie with him, I was super excited. Um, we were shooting in Bangkok, Thailand. He's, he's such an amazing actor. He's actually, he's really funny. Like he's a really funny dude. Yeah. And, um, super, super, super nice guy. Completely like not what you would see in the ring. Like he's just completely relaxed and fun loving. And you just can't believe this guy beats the crap out of people for a living. It just right. makes no sense because he's such a nice guy. Yeah, I always had uh, a lot of respect for him and uh, watched the interviews and, and behind-the-scenes things with him, and uh, that, that's awesome that you met him. I've all, that's one I'd kick people. his ass. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you yeah, owe me no, a beer. Great. <laughs> that's cool. That is cool. <laughs> GSP. And you, uh, John claude Van Damme was also in the film, correct? Did you get, to t- hang, uh, get yes, a chance to hang yes, out with him? he was in the movie, too. I did, I did. He's he's super cool too, super nice guy. Did he do any did he do any dancing? You know, at the end of the movie, um, there is an incredible dance. I don't I don't want to give too much away, but um when the movie comes out, like at the end of the movie there there's something spectacular that um all fans of the original kickboxer are definitely gonna wanna see. So Yes. <laughs> can't wait for it to come out. Cannot wait for huh? it to come out. I said we can't wait for it to come out. We're definitely gonna watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's super fun. It's, it's going to be great. Yes, indeed. Well, with all of that said, uh, Sarah, uh, website, you got a website? Um, you can follow me on Instagram, at Sarah Molecules. Um, that's the main um, social media that I do, or Twitter, at Sarah Molecule. Um, and, yeah, my, the, the trailer of the movie is online, Wishing for a Dream. So if anybody wants to check that out, it's, it's online. That is awesome. Well, Sarah... I want to say uh, thank you so much for calling in and talking with us today. And uh, we had a great time thank talking you to you. And uh, maybe down the road we'll get together again. Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget to watch um, the kickboxing movie if you're a huge fan of GSP. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I hope to talk to you guys soon. Have a good evening. You too, Sarah. Good luck with that traffic. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, thanks. I need it. Bye. I usually like well, to wait a minute. It's not an option. I, I uh, usually, oh, shut up. I usually like to wait a minute before they hang up to see if they say anything about us. 
<laughs> Before they hang up the phone? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the idiots. <laughs> nah, yeah. Why'd I waste my time calling into them? Did that guy just say he was going to kick George St. <laughs> Pierre's ass? The motherfucker said he'd only like George St. Pierre. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, fuck. How, how, do you, how do you live in California? I mean, I'm not putting down on you, Sarah. I know you're listening right now, and uh, which is cool. But, I mean, you, how do you live in California and not go to, like, Whiskey A Go-Go? Or, or, or like hit the strip every night. I could, I'd, I'd have to hit the strip every night. How do you sit in California traffic for that long to do an interview? <laughs> for twenty minutes. <laughs> yes. Are you sit in twenty minute traffic in Baton Rouge? Uh, Shit. True that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Just about Baton every Rouge day. Is... Depends on what's part of Baton Rouge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you wait and Baton do Rouge. your moving about three or four o'clock in the morning. Ain't nobody around. <laughs> yes, indeed. We got a lot of things we're going to cover here, but right now what we're going to do is we're going to take a small pause for where the calls. We're going to tell you about the sponsors of the Radio Random Network and the Russell and Mud 2 show. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some trending topics and other things. So hang in there and we'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. In the market to buy a new home? Or maybe you're wanting to put your home on the market. Contact real estate agent Tanya Halford. Tanya is a KDK Capital Regional Realty Partner and can assist you with all of your real estate needs. Contact Tanya today for your free consultation at 225-202-0657. This is Radio Random Network. Find us on the web at www.radiorandomnetwork.com. All right, we are back. <laughs> the Russell and Mutu Show right here on the Radio Random Network. Guys, the Powerball is, I guess this is a record for the Powerball. How, how, how much are we up to now? 1.5. One, 1.5? One really? 1.5. Come on. One wow. 1.5. I just need 0.5. <laughs> Yes, I'll share dude. with you when I win. I'll share with you when I win. The hell you will. <laughs> we got plans. Really? We got plans. What would you do? What would you do with with that much money if you would, would win it? Would you get it in one lump sum? No, uh, I wouldn't. You wouldn't? No. You wouldn't? I would not get lump sum. Why? What you going to do with $930 million like at one Walmart. time? Walmart. Walmart. <laughs> Walmart. You could buy a damn Walmart. I mean, or two or three. Yeah. I mean, well, you know. I just don't, I don't, I don't think I need that much money. Like, I don't I think look- I, no, and, and I wouldn't invest it because then you have to worry about losing money. You know, you, there's always an, a risk when what you, are you do an investment. Invest? There's like, like so, there's really so no- that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't get lump sum. I would get my annuity. And have those checks come in regular, and just live a simple life, and no stress. Be happy. There, there's some uh, some small business that I think that that would be great. Uh, maybe I'd invest in them or or whatnot. But I just can't see. I, I can't see me with one point three or one point five billion dollars. There's there's nothing that I could do that I I would be able to spend that money ever. So. Do you, if that if, if if you would win and you need help, just holler at me. <laughs> okay, I would do. I would. I would get some investment properties. Right me and off. you. I, I would get some. Apartments. Well, definitely. What, what but you, you could, like, you could do would, that with, with an annuity too. I mean, you don't have to have. But when you, when you have one point five billion dollars, I mean, really, what your when you invest in this. Fifty thousand dollar property. What do you think that it's really going to make back on that your total net worth? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm <laughs> That's going to be like peas, you know, right? right. You know, it's, like it's it's it, it it's worthless. I mean, man. the only thing it would be good for is to set your kids, grandkids, their grandkids, yeah. and you know, like future, you know, you know? family stuff down the way. Because you really. could never. Well, I am. I'm not gonna say you couldn't because I know you. One point five is the death of me. Mm. <laughs> You're not talking about 1.5 million. It's it would, that would be that would be pretty beat. close, but 1.5 billion is the death of me. So and being no, the wrestling that. mark that I am, I would probably start a wrestling company, a wrestling federation, and hire Hulk Hogan to run it for me. Yeah, and it'd have to be like crazy off the wall stuff that would never <laughs> that would never be profitable because you know that 1.5 billion, you could make the craziest. <laughs> Wrestling company ever. Exactly. And that's why I said I wouldn't do an investment because you got that stress. You you, you invest money into that. It, it may not 
You may lose money. Everybody back? <laughs> All right, good. Shit. You good? I'm good now. All yeah. right. I'm here. Well, I'll shout for a minute. You know, that kind of money, like I, like I said, I bet you I can uh, give me a week. I'm just saying, week, you start your own wrestling company, hire Hulk Hogan to start to run it. <laughs> you you stressing every night, wondering if you're losing money or making money. You don't have to worry about if you're losing money. It's 1.5 bill. Yeah, that's a <laughs> lot of money. Well, I don't know. I mean, in this How day and age, how much you think it's gonna start to make? To yeah, it's not as much as you think it is. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a lot. It, don't worry. It, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of money. I would, I would, I would start a super band and, and play arenas. Then, I mean, not for the money, just to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. You can rent out that's, the arena and just play to nobody. One point five bill lives. I mean, but like, if you want to do that, you can go down to like the ditch or something and play to like empty uh, seats. I'm not going to the ditch. <laughs> play like empty seats, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, no, no, no. I'd sell myself for sure because I can. I mean, with one point five billion dollars, I could buy the best marketing company there is on, uh, out there. I can buy the best promoter there is out there and and put them on payroll and say, make me a star. Put me through the machine. What I got to do? With one point five billion, you could <laughs> once a week you could put out a YouTube live excu- exclusive concert of you playing guitar and make yourself a star by that with that kind of money. It's yeah. like <laughs> I would buy my own. I mean, fuck YouTube. I'd have my own channel on uh, <laughs> you know on like Direct TV and all that. You know, I'd still have to. I mean, I I couldn't give it away. You know, it'd still have to be like on demand, you know, like the pay per view type stuff, but that's what I would do. Every time I go to a convenience store in the last two weeks, it's like I'm go I go in there, I pick me a beer up or I pick me a a a, a bag of potato chips or whatever and it's like what you think about that one point five billion? <laughs> I don't wanna buy your lottery ticket. Yeah. Uh, what you think about that nine hundred million? I'm I don't play the lottery. Well, why wouldn't you? It's one point five billion. Cause I'm not playing it at a, a million. It's like my chances, <laughs> my chances are better playing it if it's a million dollars than if it's a billion and a half. And they're like, you gotta buy it now. <laughs> are you really harassing me How about this buy? Your damn lottery are better ticket? Getting in a wreck on the way to buy that yeah. lottery ticket than it is to actually win that I'm lottery. Like, Come on, cuz I'm like, I don't play the lottery, Mm-mm. and these people at Kangaroo in Circle K are like, you, what about that 1.5? What about that 1.5? So you're not going to the Habib's best stop? I like the best stops. I can't. Well, <laughs> there's like too. 64 best stops around here, bro. Mm-hmm. They Every all time can. I look around, it's like, what? yeah. It's the same people. Bye bye up here. That's a grandpa. Bye bye you. One. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, he talks with the, you know, nothing against bye bye. Bye bye's good people. You know. They're only people to sell liquor on Sunday. They are. Yeah. You shouldn't have said that because they ain't now. That's probably illegal as hell. They be in some illegal shit. Bro, in Dino Springs, they just hit. Yeah, what's it? They just hit what, the is, guy. what the hell is this? Uh, uh, juicy. The juicy is like um uh, like the synthetic marijuana that they're putting in this oils. That you can smoke through a vaporizer now that uh, you you get high like off the synthetic marijuana they w- they were selling. Well, oh boy, that had this in <laughs> this uh, store. Yeah, yeah, the store. He had a fake wall that spun around. Are you serious? Yes, and, had, like, and they cases had cases of this shit. Cases of this it. juicy, and he was selling it to the high school kids. And you know what he was doing? There was a kid at Dillon Springs High School actually overdosed on two this of them. Shit. Two yes. Of- and, and and then what he was doing it was he he was taking his newspapers that he was getting from the morning advocate or whatever and he was pricing them at eighty dollars instead of fifty dollars is what he was making off from them so he was selling newspapers he was selling newspapers for fifty to eighty dollars I'll sell you a newspaper and you get this free yeah. bottle of juicy with it well dude, he's not selling the shit well that's not I mean you know. That's not, um, yeah, that's not uh, suspicious at all when they come and check the books. You Would know? that be price gouging on the newspaper? Maybe. I mean, you, know? you know they're 50 cents. <laughs> yeah. We sell no juicy here. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you're selling $50 no juicy. newspapers. You're doing something illegal. Don't spin this wall around. Yeah. <laughs> A spinning wall with, with juicy. And now, this stuff, this it's, it's synthetic THC, correct? It's like artificial it's THC. It's not THC at all. It's uh, synthetic uh, uh, chemicals that they're making that they're, they're, they're putting on things that they're claiming that it's it's uh, marijuana 
related, and it, it has nothing to do with marijuana. It's it's synthetic chemicals that they're they're putting out there, and it's it's not good. Mm-mm. If there any, if there is any kids out there listening, don't don't go buy that crap. Juicy. Okay. Juicy. Stay away from Habib's drugs because yeah. Habib's drugs is fake. They get yeah. You know? I walked in the store the other day. They had this uh, stuff. It was called O period P period M period. And it says, <laughs> Opium. Opium. Right. And it says cradium at the bottom. And I'm like, it's twenty nine ninety nine. What the hell is it? Yeah. So I Google it, and it's like opium. It's opium derivatives. Don't buy opium. Don't buy that. Lord have mercy. <laughs> yeah. That's that's crazy. I mean, and they they found a way. I mean, there's people actually buying this. Like you said, it's the, the kids buying the it. The kids don't know any different though. Do what they, you mean they don't know any different? They can buy it at the damn. They don't store. know. They're being that's, told it's synthetic marijuana. Right. I mean, you know, and it's not even marijuana. It's just chemicals that want- every kid. In America, uh, just about every kid in America has a, a damn cell phone. You know, every one of them hears the news. Everybody knows what the synthetic marijuana okay, shit is. Okay, okay, but you're you're a teenager, dude. You walk into the gas station, you look, and it says OPM, and you're like, "Hey, can I get a pack of that?" And they're like, "Sure," because Habib sells it to you. Then you take it and you go home with opium. <laughs> oh, much, no, right? OPM, not opium. Yeah, that's insane. That's just insane. I could not, would not, and will never. I mean, that's and and how much was it? How much were they selling? Did they have a price on yeah, how much? Yeah, Eighty bucks. Nine nine nine. Oh, really? Uh huh. Okay, yeah, that's not suspicious For two at all. Pills. <laughs> it's pills. It's in pill form. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm gonna make. Well, never mind. I better not say that on here. We'll be black, bald, blacklisted. But uh, from the lottery to synthetic marijuana to uh, on and on. Yeah, soap operas in Thailand. We've pretty much covered it all. Now, I wanted what I wanted to ask our, our guest earlier, Miss Sarah, was what kind of damn? What was the name of this uh, soap opera that she played on? That's what I want to know. Uh, Wikipedia you know, didn't have that information. You know, I mean, it was an American soap opera. Or no, it was it, it was, was Thai. Thai. Yeah, I wonder if it's was based off the same thing. When she was, uh, you know, teenager, like fourteen years old. We should old. check that out. I wonder if you, you know, they got like America's Got Talent and British, you know, the British Got Talent. I wonder Probably if it was like, you know, America's Got uh, Days of Our Lives with what, what's his name, Victor Ties and Jack, Days of our lives. And, and they got their version of Days of Our Lives with like this, this like five foot tall man from Thailand playing playing, playing Victor. You know, that would be fucking hilarious. <laughs> but what if they got, like, rip-offs in other countries of Days of Our Lives? They, they, they do. Like, they actually Victor, do. He's like, Victor Royal. Yeah, my name is... <laughs> <Victor. laughs> like Borat. <laughs> like you the know, Borat Victor, shit. Victor on uh, Young and the Restless was the, the, a, the alpha male. Yeah, he was the, the yeah, shit. Yeah, he was the shit. Money bags. <laughs> yeah. Victor. Yeah, he talked. Victorio. He talked. Yeah. He talked like Steven Seagal, actually. <laughs> what was the guy? Is it his days Victor, of was, Victor was smooth. Victor was like, Nikki, I don't want to talk. Nikki. <laughs> yeah, Nikki. <laughs> Are you crazy? Yeah. Stay away from Jack. Shame. I'm the female my, here. Y'all know my, more about the damn soap opera than I, don't I, don't I do. About I just <laughs> remember Victor. I have no uh, and Victor and Jack, you know, because they was always Jack was always trying to take Victor's company, and he they, took all his wives. They own the, the perfume company. Yeah, LeBeau or, or it was, was it like Jabo? And, and Victor Jabo was. I spent a bunch of money on Jabos. Yeah, uh, was that back in the day? Back in the high school days. Yeah. And they still, Jabos is still a big company. It's yeah, still $80 the, for a pair of Jabos. Where, where they sell them? So much is that? Online? Tainty Queens and in Hammond. Teens, teens and queens, queens. Yeah, teens. They still it's still around. Queens. Like they got these old people that's working in teens queens. That there. dude's a hustler, man. Yeah, he's eighty years old. He's still selling your bows. Yeah, <laughs> you go in there. He, I mean, I used to buy, you know, the clothes that I, I played music uh, with. You know, uh, dress clothes there. I mean, because you can bargain with him. You know, he have, have a shirt in there for like twenty five dollars, and I'm like, so, oh man, that's twenty five dollars. Like, dude, it's your lucky day. $10. That shirt that you're holding in your hand, twenty percent off just now. Just you know. for you. Right, right. <laughs> and you bought that shit every time, didn't you? Yeah, he talked me into buying. Because that was a good shirt. You wanted it anyway, and he just right, gave right. you a bargain on it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he's buying that shit illegal. I can probably, <laughs> I'm just saying, allegedly, I'm just, you know, uh, off of probably some people stealing the ship from the shipyard down there and, and 
you know, when the ships come in on the dock, they're probably stealing these clothes and sending them down there to him. And he's selling, you know, he's not paying probably about $100 a crate for it. So he's selling to us $20 a fucking shirt. Man, he's still making a killing. He yeah. talked me into buying a Congo hat of every t- of a different color. Every time I went in, I had a black one. I had a pink one. That's I had a green problem. one. I didn't I never had... buy a Congo hat. Well, you know what? You know what? Nobody wore them damn hats. And you're the only one that bought them. <laughs> No, I didn't buy all of them. I'm, I'm just going to point this out. I remember, you know, it was unique to see a big guy. I mean, it fit me being a big guy, you know. But as far as, like, I remember when I first started, everybody was looking like, what the, f- why are you wearing that? You know, and then, like, six months later, everybody started wearing them. You know, it was cool. You were to just have ahead hat. of your time. That's, that's all. all the time. Yeah. That's, that's the way it is. Partners of Crime came out down in New Orleans at the the party. Who was that? Partners of Crime down in New Orleans. Is that somebody, that's one of your, uh, Partners in crime is that is that one of uh, that was the, who made the the Kangos famous man? Oh really? Yeah. No shit. You didn't know that? I did not. I'm at the school you on that later maybe. He, he didn't care who made him famous. Room, he, he was setting trends. <laughs> he was trying a trendsetter. To, trying to. He's still yeah, trying to set trends. Maybe that's where I'm messing up. Is like partners of crime, <laughs> RDM. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> now sometimes I mean it, setting trends is hard. You know I mean sometimes. It works. Sometimes you can come up with some cool shit, and everybody's like, oh, that's cool. And then sometimes you come up with some shit, and people are like, man, you need to be locked up. That ain't right. Yeah. You know, you just stick yourself out there on that limb, and you just can't get back to the surface. Yeah, you probably get that more times than not. Huh? Yeah, but when I do hit it right, it's big. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Okay, you got a 50 50 shot there. At right? everything. What you, think of, what you think about the uh, best damn root beer? The best damn root beer is not bad. It tastes like root beer, it's hard root beer. Uh, it's. It's actually not outdated, like the beer that me and Mudtooth have been drinking. Uh, <laughs> that was an accident. But uh, with all of that said, I want you know I brought up Peter Crunker earlier about uh, with uh, with the actor. I wonder if she knew who Peter Crunker was. Uh, no, I, I doubt I think it. She, she, I think she, I got I got the joke. I but, got it. Uh, I bet you when I said it, she grabbed her titties. <laughs> you think so, Peter Crocker? She was like, <gasps> "Uh oh, yep, <laughs> uh oh." <laughs> Watch the tattoos. You think they have uh, Peter Crocker over there in Thailand? I don't know. What do you think they'd call him? <laughs> sure, it's not Peter. Uh, not Peter I'm sure Crocker. We, I'm sure we could <laughs> pronounce yeah, it. It's not Thailand. This is going to be the racist. We've talked. We've called Habib. Habib. <laughs> And this is, and I could have swore earlier when she was talking about her and her aunt. I thought she said they were chase, used to chase goats. Did they? <laughs> did she, she say she goats? Said that. Or goats? She said that. So I asked her, "Are you have you chased any and she goats?" She was like, "What? What? Yeah, what, what are you WTF? Talking about? Are you talking about what? What, what? what goats? There's no goats over here. I was gonna ask, has any goats chased you? <laughs> She's like, I'm yeah, in she LA. had no clue. Go, goat? No goats. I think she was kind of nervous. <laughs> She probably Googled me. <laughs> that made her nervous, huh? <laughs> probably so. Yes, indeed. We're in Louisiana yeah, going, she she's in you. L.A. traffic. Um, What's going on? We're talking about goats over here. Yeah, we're talking about goats, which, I mean, if she was chasing goats down here in Louisiana, that's not really. Well, she did say she came ordinary. to Mississippi. Maybe she might have chased some goats in Mississippi. I don't know. Mississippi is poor than Louisiana. Easy. In Louisiana, the only pride we take care of. Of is that we're better than Mississippi. <laughs> You're worse than Mudtooth with Alabama. <laughs> no. Oh, Damn. don't bring uh, up nah, Alabama. I can't. We ain't going to go there because Mudtooth will be in here trying to be like, that boy defended Alabama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he so I'm going to I'm, I'm put Mississippi in 50th. 50th? Yeah. Mudtooth says his goal is to piss on Bear Bryant's statue. What? That's what he wants to do. Bear Bryant was a good coach. But not to Mudtooth. <laughs> not to Mudtooth. My tooth wants to piss on him. I bet you Mudtooth like Nick Saban when he was here at LSU. He don't like him now, though. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the trend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, that's what I don't understand. And you know tomorrow if Nick Saban got on TV and said, guys, I'd I'm come back, back to, to LSU. LSU. I'd like Everybody'd my job like, back. Woo! Because everybody hates Les Miles right now. Uh, it, what, that, that, yeah, Les Les like Miles he cares. Is, yeah, he's a winning coach. <laughs> but once a year, I come out and I put... Alabama on everything because LSU fans hate Alabama. That's right. I've seen your, I've seen your post on Facebook about Alabama. L, uh, Alabama's in the national championship right now, right? They just won the national championship. I think oh, so. Okay. That's how much I keep up with them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but <laughs> once you a just month, do it to piss people <laughs> off. Once a year, <laughs> when LSU plays Alabama, I piss everybody off. It's because 
nobody had a problem with Alabama before Nick Saban went to right, Alabama. Right, before Saban went to Alabama, Florida was our biggest rivalry. Right. You know so it's saying? like, everybody's pissed off at Alabama. I'm like, dude, y'all just pissed off at Nick Saban. So let's 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 break down and, to the and, real. And, and who wouldn't <laughs> take a shot at the NFL if given a chance? What college coach wouldn't? I mean... Nick Saban's over there just shitting on the rest of the the the, the college coaches, and that's what people hate about Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, I, you know, the LSU thing is uh, cool. The Les Miles thing, which we talked about with my tooth on the show before, uh, you know, everybody had come down on him because they couldn't win a game there for what they had like a little streak going, like three or four games they didn't win or something like that. Yeah, there was a couple. And, yep, and yep. then we're going to fire you and, and give you $15 million. Okay. Like, I, and, <laughs> yeah, like I'm real upset. And, you yeah. Me $15 million. And I'm going to go, and I'm just going to go to Michigan. But look how the LSU fans turned on Les Miles. It's like, all right, you turned on Nick Saban when he went to Alabama or when he took off to, to Florida or whatever it was. But then when, when it comes to Les Miles, as long as he's winning, the LSU fans was hot on him. But when, as soon as, he didn't make this playoff game or whatever, or he lost three in a row. LSU fans turn them. They're like, it's time to, to fire less miles. And I'm like, I'm an Alabama fan, but I'm looking at LSU fans and I'm saying, LSU fans, this, he's a winning coach. He wins. He wins every year. He brings y'all to championships every year. And y'all ready to turn on him because he lost three games in a row. That's ridiculous. How you how you gonna do that to your coach? No loyalty. No loyalty. If they winning, <laughs> yeah, you know that's the thing. <laughs> I mean, and if he just said I'm going to uh, Michigan, I mean, who would have stepped up and took his place? Everybody in Louisiana would hate Michigan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can hear, oh, we suck again. <laughs> yeah. You know, screw Michigan. <laughs> I mean, Lord have mercy. <laughs> oh, we're gonna go off a little bit here. Uh, some news that was happening this week. Uh, first and foremost, we lost uh, one of the original, I guess, um, glam rockers. I, I guess would be uh, Bowie. His name, yeah, Bowie. Uh, David, uh, he died. Uh, cancer. Nobody even knew that. Didn't he just put a new album out? I'm not sure about that. See, I don't really. I never really kept up. I mean, all due respect, God rest his soul. Never really kept up with him. He did just put a new album out. As a matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> the dude, uh, I heard a little special on him about on NPR and, and on David Bowie. He he had $55 million from what he made from his music career. Oh, yeah. And he took his $55 million and he flipped it over into tech. Um, when Metallica and when Eminem and the Big Grapes was fighting against Napster... Um, I got some things to say about that, but keep going. When when they was fighting uh, against this and 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 saying don't put this out, David Bowie started taking all his music and he started taking uh, his MP3s and stuff like that and putting them out for free. Mm-hmm. And he turned his fifty five million dollars into nine hundred million dollars. Oh, yeah, definitely. He, he he flipped it. He went into the tech industry, and um, right before when he found out that he had cancer. Uh, right before he was getting ready to pass, he put out his album and he put out his last couple concerts. And then he told people, his fans, that he was uh, terminal and that he was about to pass. Wow. And he, he did it. He flipped, flipped $55 million into $900 million. He is the He was the richest um, rock and roll star out of the UK past Paul McCartney and... All the Beatles and everything, nine hundred million because he right, put his money right. back into tech. Yes. Well, that's funny you said about Paul McCartney. I mean, Paul McCartney just recently got all his money back. You know, I mean, he went through a couple of divorces and then he got friends with Michael Jackson, who really put the screws to him, which I thought was funny as hell. Michael, you know, I got all his money. I, he said, "Invest, you know, buy a catalog." And Michael went and bought the Beatles catalog. <laughs> 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 buy any one except for that one. But, uh, you, you know, you brought up a, a, the thing about Napster, and I remember that. Um, I, I was still in high school when all that went down. But uh, I can't really say nothing about, about Eminem at the time because Eminem, I think, was still – he had just come out. You know, he, he was fresh on the scene. But as far uh, – Metallica was the one that started this, which I – a few good songs, never really cared for him. Um, well, I mean, 
to each their own. I'm just saying, I mean, after Inner Sandman, what did they have? I mean, what did they do? You know, they was the first. I'll tell you what, other than Gene Simmons, in which, uh, of Kiss, Metallica, them boys was the first first cats to really go uh, corporate, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of their fans kind of turned on them. And they wasn't selling it. If you go back and look, they wasn't selling no albums. It wasn't because of Napster. But, I mean, it was cool that they, you know, I guess they that, that was the way they uh, got their money back from the albums they wasn't selling was they said, well, Napster stole all our stuff. You know, they got it in the public domain and people's downloading it and we can't sell an album. Yeah, but if they would have, <clears throat> they tried to fight back at at the beginning because it, it hurt their sales. But they what they didn't realize in the big picture mm-hmm. is that 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 was the way that the the world was turning to. We're turning from uh, uh to records to eight tracks to CDs to MP3s to we're going to a virtual world. And Metallica didn't want that because that's where their their revenue was at. But uh, they have to realize now that MP3s and, and and selling ads through stuff like that now. And I'm sure Lars uh, Lars the drummer he was the the big advocate for it. I'm sure that he realized that now. Um, he was just pissed off because he ran out of acid. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't buy nothing. I mean, man, was, you know, and none of those guys got along. You know, I remember when uh, the first time I saw Metallica or, or, or the CD cover, and it was like off their first album. Those cats were ugly as hell. They had one, he had like some shit growing out of his face. It looked like another head. You know, and then they had one. It looked he he was like really young, but at a really young age, he looked like an old Italian woman. Those you know, all, those guys mustache all look, and all. Yeah, they you know? all look fifty years older than what they were supposed to be at that time. Right, right. And I'm wondering, you know, how people kind of look at me on this local scene. I was talking to a guy Friday night we played, and uh, I told him he asked how old I was. I told him I was thirty, and he started laughing at me. And he thirty? Yes. yes. No shit. And he said, I thought you were about my age. And I said, how old are you? He said, 51. <laughs> I'm 35, dude. I'm really? Night life, huh? Yeah. yeah, night life. Night life. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Night life on the Louisiana music scene. And that's what it's all about here. So uh, let me talk me. to you. You want to talk to me? What you got for me, brother? I do want to talk to you. Um, I'm just getting uh, into all this stuff, man. And and I, I really dig how uh, you got your stuff set up and uh i, I want to learn a little more about it but, right right um I, i've been listening to your your podcast and you interview people and you put it out there uh for people uh, for other people but you 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 don't say a lot about yourselves uh now what i've noticed is that <clears throat> when you <clears throat> when you talk to uh the people that you interview uh, they, they talk about themselves a lot, and of right, right. course, that is what it's supposed to be about. But at the same time, I heard a, a guy the other day. He's like uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Fortune of the uh, Statler Jimmy Brothers, Fortune. who was on yeah, 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 backstage yeah. with hashtag. He was my guest this week on the Tuesday show. Yes, yeah, it was Jimmy Fortune, and he was. Uh, he said, "Well, I used to play for a, a cover band," and you're like, "Oh yeah, now that's what you do." Right now, I know you on a different level than uh, what your fans. Know you on uh, RadioRandomNetwork.com and, and and on the podcast, and I see you you playing these your three four times a week. You're going out and you're playing these these shows, and you're putting on these great shows. I and, appreciate it. Uh, your your guitar skills are off the chain. They're they're um, they're great. I don't think that you get enough. Um, recognition or exposure on your podcast as as what you do. Now I know it's not about you. Right, I know right. it's a, about your people. But tell me something about you, man. Because when when I met you, um, I came down to uh more, more Paul or French settlement or, or they don't they don't pay for us, so we don't <laughs> mention them. But I remember it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I come down there, I check that out, and I'm like, this dude is. Super talented on his guitar, man. And we come at, come down there and check you out. And you started talking to me about the podcast, and the, and the podcast and stuff is irrelevant, man. But your your guitar uh, <clears throat> skills are just spectacular, and you you have knowledge of like a jukebox. When when you come to these these places and, and, and play and maybe your audience don't know this about it. And if y'all don't know this about him, maybe y'all should know this about him. But when he, he comes to a place, it's like a jukebox. It's like, you can 
put in whatever you want to, or you can you can uh, request whatever song you want to, and this man knows how to play that song. He, uh, it's 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 really really entertaining to me because these people come up while he's playing, and he stops what he's doing. And he plays that song that they want to hear. Now, what I want to know from you is how in the hell did you learn all these songs? How did you manage? That's <laughs> if y'all hear my angry bird. <laughs> it's all good to come free with the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, but how did you learn these these songs, man? Because it's you say, how old are you? 30. 30? Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 30 years, like, really, how did you learn all these songs and to to put out all this music that you put out? And I know they're cover songs or whatever, but you play them in your own way. You you take these songs like uh, the Marvin Gaye song and you turn them into Let's Get It On. You put a little Bruno Mars in there. You mix it up like that. And these right, are right. cover bands, man. But you really, really, really entertain the people that that comes out to your shows and people know you. So I have no idea (laughs) about like how long you've been doing it or how we've got to this point. I know what you do now right? right. because we've just recently met, but I don't know how you got to this point. I don't know um, how you learned the skills that you put out on this guitar. I don't know uh, how you've met all these people (laughs) <laughs> that you know around here that everybody I speak to, whether it's Tommy McMorris or a, a little G dog in the hood, they know Russell McClain um, around here, man. Well, I mean, so I, I've never, first and foremost, the podcast thing and the radio thing. I mean, that's, uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I mean, that's, that's my, I, I love it. I love doing that. I don't, I don't use it to put myself over because, to be honest with you, Will, um, and I've never really, nobody's ever really asked me any of this, and uh, I don't I don't play music for recognition. I think that's where a lot of people mess up. Everybody wants somebody to look at them. Everybody wants to go to Nashville. Everybody wants to be a recording artist. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to make it big. Well, just like he was talking about that lottery ticket a while ago, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the chances are type thing. It's the same thing, you know. Um, I don't, I don't have to brag on myself, and 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 I just try to stay as, and I do stay as humble as I can, and and a lot of times Tanya gets on to me because it's like sometimes I don't have, she says I don't have the confidence, but to be honest with you, I, I don't do this for recognition. Um, when you wake up in the morning, you, you wake up. I, some people do it, some people don't, but I wake up at a different place every day. Uh, I don't know. It, it's all feeling. Everything's a feel for me. Uh, learning the songs, uh, well, first and foremost, this is a business. Music is business. It's not, if I wanted to do it for the music uh, aspect of it, uh, or, or the, well, it is enjoyable. I do enjoy myself when I'm on stage. That's, that's, and to be honest, that's me. If you want to see Russell McClain, uh, the real Russell McClain, comfortable in the zone, uh, that's me on stage. Now, you're sitting here as a different person. You know, all the songs, to be honest, I mean, man, I mean, I don't really practice. I, I can go three, four weeks and I don't even touch none of the stuff, you know, uh, but it, it's a business. And the first thing you do whenever you get in, you know, first thing you want to do is when you when you have a startup or when you're in business, you want to learn everything you can about the product or, or what you're getting into. So as an entertainer uh, or, or a musician or a singer or whatever you want to call me, uh, you got to learn. I, I, you got to learn the history, and you got to know the history, and you got to learn how to. There's a, a such thing called stage psychology. You got to learn how to read the crowd. If they want country, and he asks for a country song, I'm gonna give him a country song. If he asks for some heavy metal, you know what? I can do some heavy metal. I'm not bragging at all, and I, I hope any don't you know any of my friends listen to this, don't take it this way. But I mean, it, it's all feeling. I've learned. I've had some. Uh, I, I've had. I've been blessed to learn a trait that's, to be honest with you, it's dying, you know, and I'm not, that's a totally different show, but, you know, you take, you know, starting out, uh, I was, I was blessed because uh, six months into learning how to play the guitar, I was on stage, uh, six months after being in that band, I I was running the band, 
Uh, it, it, it's a thing. It's an it factor. Not everybody has it. Uh, you see it sometimes with different people. Different people have it. it it's charisma. And, and as far as the music, as far as being on stage, as far as like what I do on the guitar, I, I can't. It's not going to be the same every time. I can't teach nobody. You can't. You can't buy the guitar center. It's a. It's a feeling. You know, and my knowledge as far as my, I love music. I've always loved music since I was a little kid. My, my grandpa, Ben McDonald, uh, you know, he had a shed. We'd sit out in a shed, and he listened to the oldie station. Well, I was always into the oldie station, so that's where it started. So if you want to talk about, you know, some music from the 1950s, we can go there, and I can tell you everything you want to know. If you want to talk about the 60s, we can do that too. Yeah. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this is a business. And that's how I treat it when I go out. I don't go out and I don't drink. I don't get drunk. I don't get fucking, I don't get, you know, stoned or, or I'll go out my mind on stage. I get up there and I handle my business. First sign of drama, first sign of somebody not taking care of business, first sign of uh, immaturity on stage, I'm gone. I don't have time for that. That's right. Uh, I'm not better than anybody. And, I, you know, I'm not better than anybody. I, no, I don't think I am. But it is about business. But it's it's business, and that's how I was taught. And I I, I mean I, I look at myself, and I look at guys like Todd O'Neill, who had, you know about the same time we'd started out. Uh, and and I, I I can't really say anybody else's name around here that's doing this, but uh, we're I'm a last of a dying breed. There's not going to be another guy like me come along. And if there is, it's a miracle. I came pre YouTube. Whenever I had to learn a song, I had to learn a song on the fly because it was on a uh, cassette tape, first and foremost. Secondly, the, the radio I had only had a fast-forward button on it. And after you learning a part on a guitar or you learning a, a song, after you turn it over three or four times, that song starts dragging. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you better learn your shit quick. Right. And I've been, a bit, I've been blessed to start off in, at an age where, uh, you know, being I, I started on, when I was 15, the first time I got on stage, with a band, I, I did. It wasn't just with a bunch of kids my age. It was I was with professional musicians. Uh, Creole man Amade Frederick was the first one, uh, which Amade A Five Frederick is my bass player now for the Magnolia Fire Band. Um, Frederick, yes sir. And he's. I mean, we pretty much was brought up. I guess we was raised together as far as music is concerned. And his dad, who is a, a pretty much a legend in, in hell in Louisiana as far as the blues goes taught us and and it wasn't it was you went in with a tough skin it, it was only the strong survived because there was times when i was on stage if i took a lead ride and i wasn't supposed to you got your ass chewed out you got your you you reach over he cut your amp off and dare you to turn it back on come on yeah and it, it, and then it was that way that's the way he learned that's the way you know he was taught so that's how he taught us and then you know fast forward into you know the next few years I, you know, I had a chance to, you know, Chris Gray and 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 the Russell Walkers and Kip Sonyes and all those guys was big playing big in Hammond. But then Chris Gray did something, and you know, anyway, you can say what you want about Chris Gray. At the time when Chris Gray was really hitting, the the reason Chris Gray was so popular because he stayed ahead of the game and he stayed relevant, and he was always changing things. And he brought a band from. Baton Rouge to Hammond called Contagious. And up until then, all I heard was, uh, you know, uh, country music or Johnny B. Good. That's it. I never heard anything. I, didn't, I never did go out to box on anything else. And I never forget walking into a, a, a facility in Hammond where they were playing and these guys are on stage doing fucking Jungle Boogie, man. And that blew my mind. Now, everybody else in the club was like, what the hell is this? It was over everybody else's head because they never heard anything about it. You know, ever, never heard anything like that. And and I watched. And, and, and you know, he, Chris surrounded himself with Contagious, which was uh, Timmy C. Haney and, and, and Steve Haney, who is uh, who who now plays in the band with me. And, and, and you know, I've, I'd played with Steve on and off for a few years. And then, uh, you know, some things had happened, and I – I needed a place to stay. Uh, and Steve, you know, we was playing here and there. It wasn't necessarily in a band together. And Steve had a studio. He told me to come to a studio. I could stay there as long as I wanted, you know. Well, what he didn't tell me was I was fixing to go to school. Well, we didn't. Little did I know, pretty much. I was about to go to school, you know. So when I got into that studio, it, it was a different Steve Haney. It wasn't the cool, smooth Steve Haney on stage. It was 
Steve business. Haney business. Yes. yes. With the music, right. and you've been playing this shit wrong for years now. And I'm gonna teach you the right way if you want to learn. And he, there was no bones. I mean, he didn't pull no punches. If it sucked, he told me it sucked. If it was good, he wouldn't tell me if it was good or not sometimes. But he does now. You know, you fast forward now, like Saturday night. And then to be honest with you now, I cannot imagine myself. And I could do it. I can go play lead, play three-piece and everything else. I can't imagine myself playing on stage without Steve Haney now. You know, and it, it's because of the, it, it, it makes me a different player because he he possesses something that brings out the best in me. Um, but... I hope that answered your question, but he's just a, uh, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to guys like, you know, to Steve Haney and the Elton, the Barnes family, Elton Barnes, uh, even, hell, even Timmy Barnes. Elton Barnes, El- Timmy Barnes, the, yes. yes, Ronnie Barnes, Ronnie, Elton, Timmy. I, I want to ask you a little bit, Turn that mic a little oh, bit I'm sorry, <clears throat> I want to ask you a little bit about them. Um, I. I started looking back on uh, the uh, Monster series. Uh, Glenn Monster, actually, I, I, I looked up his uh, his uh, videos that uh, he did of you, and I actually want to interview him because I'm a videographer myself. And yeah, I give you his. I, I like give you his contact information. Awesome, man! I appreciate that. Um, but um, I was looking back, like on the Rax videos and stuff that you did, and you got a uh, Ronnie Bourne Jr. playing the drums in the background there, and. <clears throat> I've had the pleasure of filming Ronnie uh, a, a couple of times, but I really hadn't got to talk to him. And uh, in in my area that I'm getting into uh, with vision, we're we're starting to uh, what I want to do is is kind of start being the glue that's that's going on uh, around with these cover bands uh, and and getting and getting the uh, stuff together about the venues that you can play at and the uh, the marketing. The, the, yeah, yeah, getting everything yes. together and start putting all that together. But man, you got these 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 great people that you play with, and I see them in different bands now. Um, how's that work? I mean, you got a drummer that plays in this <laughs> band. <laughs> you got a drummer that plays in this band, and then I go check this band out, and that drummer's playing at this band. And, and and it works the same way around. Well, I don't ever tell anybody. You know, when I when we do when we did that with uh, it was myself and Amade Frederick on bass. Uh, and that's a five Amade Frederick uh, Junior. And, and and Mudtooth playing the harp and, and singing, and little Ronnie playing the drums. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we. Uh, I don't say you know if you're playing with me, you can only play with me. I, you know, it, it, little Ronnie needs their money, or Bill needs their money, or if Emma Day needed the money, and they got a gig and they booked a gig, or they was doing these other things. Yeah, I booked around their them. schedule. They yeah, should. I don't give a shit. Right. You know, but what always would happen, and and this is why you see those guys with different people and this and that and the other, is, and I'm gonna give you some insight, and this is some shit I'll probably regret saying later on, but <laughs> uh, this what I have are, are you know talent that talent aspect of it, sometimes it's a curse. Sometimes it's a blessing. The blessing is, like I told you a while ago, I don't need recognition. I don't care if somebody is listening because I have to get this feeling. I, I got to get this energy out of me. You know, it's like breathing. Um, sometimes I have to step away. Uh, Whenever, and I've been blessed, again, and I don't take this as uh, anybody listening, any of my musician friends that do listen, don't take this as a uh, me being uh, arrogant or anything like that, and which if you know me, you know I'm not. But uh, like I said, it's a blessing and a curse. But any band I've ever been in or any band I've ever started, we pretty much, I'm not going to say we ruled the school. You know, we, we was the best thing that ever happened. But, man, we fucking rolled. Yeah, so that I mean, that's why I'm wondering. Like the, now I, I've just met you just recently, but like the RDM band um, that had Ronnie Bourne, yourself, uh, Mudtooth in it. Um, what happened there? I mean, um, because it, from how I see it, you're a very, very, very talented vocalist and lead man, and you should have your own band. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Like, like, it should be there. Um, you do cover music and stuff, man, but you're just super, super, super talented. And anybody that hadn't 
that uh, heard him on on the guitar. Uh, y'all, I mean, y'all need to get on the internet and check that out. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. <laughs> but, um, like, well, what happened with RDM is I got, um, at the time of that, we was doing that, and and we stayed pretty busy. Uh, I had a lot of things going on at that time in my life, uh, and it was. Uh, I'm not going to get all sappy and stuff, but it was a little too much for me to handle, man. Uh, I, I was carrying around a lot of weight on my shoulders. And it got to the point where I just exhausted myself, and it wound up with me um, pretty much making myself sick and and having to uh, you know do a little time. I went I had to go be rushed to the emergency room on Halloween night, oh. and that was pretty much the end of it, you know. Uh, and and nothing against those guys, you know. It was fun. I had a good time. I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. I you know I, I it was just too fucking much. And uh, I had to figure some things out. So I, you know, RDM pretty much uh, deteriorated after that. And I stayed friends with those guys. Me and little Ronnie's played together since then. Me and, you know, in different bands. Uh, But in this business, um, and you got to be personable with people, you know. And if you're my friend, you're my friend, you know. Now, we're business partners. We're business partners. That's fine, too. But like you said, you can talk to somebody from, uh, you know, in Joe's saloon, and they know, uh, you know who Russell McLean is because Russell McLean's been in there, and they talk, you know, whatever. And you, should, like you said, you can go to the hood and talk to somebody, and they know who Russell McLean is because I, I'm not in competition you get around, yeah. with nobody. That's right. Yeah. Um, of course. And there's a lot of people that are. There's a lot of people that's in competition with me, dude. When I first started, I was blackballed just about from every fucking club that wasn't <laughs> Hammond, and I didn't understand did why. Your grandpa. And, yes. Yes. <laughs> And I did not understand why, you know, I, I didn't know what the hell, I, I didn't realize it was a, a envy thing. Oh, these young cats are going up, coming up, man. Yeah, well, they I'm, made it very hard. I'm, I'm starting to cover, uh, I, I've been in this business for a long time. And like I told you earlier, I, st- I really started out with the, the R and B and uh, hip hop side of it. Right. But it's, <laughs> I've heard so many times over the years, and I've tried to fight against it about like there's crabs in a bucket, and that like you try to make it up out. There's always somebody trying to pull you back down, and and especially in what what we call the the ninety five scene, which is the North Shore uh, right, right. Uh, five hundred four uh, two two five area over there. It's like when somebody tries to come up out of that the other people talk about them or, or there there's those what they call haters and stuff like that. And, um, what I'm trying to do with my brand, I, I run into that a lot. I mm-hmm. run into that a lot that, that people don't want you to do this with so-and-so, or they don't want you to spread this with so-and-so, or they don't want you to mess with so-and-so in, in the music business because they don't like them or don't want to be there. But at, at, at the, at the same time, the 985 music, it don't matter what you're in. It don't matter if you're in the country or if you're in the rap business. The, these people that's doing business around the 985, and, and what I'm trying to relieve the problem is, is that these people, the other people that's doing things, really, right, they right. don't want you to succeed. And that's not good at all. For, well, for music. you're never going to get away from that, man. You cannot fight that, you know, and it's not, and I'm going to, I'm going I'm I'm to, I'm going to guarantee you that I'm, I'm well, I'm not going to guarantee you, but I'm, I'm going to bet you this, the people, well, I'm not going to I'm going to fucking guarantee you this. <laughs> the people that put you down that are in this business don't need to be in this business. There are people on the scene today, and I'm not going to mention any names, Justin Adams, um, <laughs> that don't need to be in this fucking business. Right. Because they've ruined it. Well, you know, that's in every industry, though. It is. That, yeah, because, that's why I said, you know, country... with the real estate, I have the same thing. You know, I find why you're not in competition with each other. You know what right. I'm saying? I mean, there's plenty enough out there there's, for everybody. If you, I mean, in any, 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 any industry, there's a pie, you know, and everybody wants a piece of that pie. And you have to, you have to be willing to sacrifice. Everything like some people ask sometimes, man, you're so fucking good at guitar. Like that's hard. That's hard. Well, it wasn't really hard for me, first and foremost, because. Uh, but what it did was, uh, I can't really do nothing else, you know, because I, that's all I devoted my time to, and from 15 years old until 
Now that's I was I was music. Uh, well, there was a stint where I was a professional wrestler. Uh, there was a stint where, you know, I'm, I've always. Deckhand. Uh, yeah, I mean, but I can't swing a hammer. I fuck, I can't even read a tape measure. But uh, you know, I can make somebody turn around and look at me. But that piece of that pie I'm talking about, though, everybody wants a piece of it, and then, and then some, they get a little greedy, and they want to take your piece, you know, and and like I'm gonna quote Mud Tooth on this is. You can have a piece of that pie. You just got to know how to access it. But don't come up and try to take my piece. Yeah, well, like the the thing that I've always heard, like over in India, man, like there's these rug salesmen, right? Like, you walk down, <laughs> like you walk down to this aisle with these rug salesmen, and there's 15 rug salesmen, and they're all selling damn it's rugs, damn right? Thing. But they all have tea together, and they're all they're just trying to sell rugs. So it's like. Why wouldn't you be like that in the music industry? Why wouldn't you try to help the person up that's below you or right above you instead of kicking them down the 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 stairs and um and saying they're not supposed to be there? And I found that everything from the rap industry all the way to the cover band or, or even country cover band industry is that look we don't want to be open and honest with these people. We don't want to be open from even from the uh, sets that they do to the prices that they make at bars. It's like, come on, cuz why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you tell the other people that's coming up below you how to get in these places or how to to charge these prices because you're hating on the people that. That's coming up below you. Well, I mean, that's that's been there for years. I mean, that's a fight that I don't think it's like a battle that will never be won. I mean, if you can do it, if you can, I, I've tried. I, I did it, and that's one reason why we launched the podcast. Yeah, it sounds of Louisiana back in the day was to try to start weeding out the people that really wasn't talented and that was coming up and, and or, or the people that wasn't, you know, I wouldn't say talented, but the people that was trying to blackball or, or trying to screw over. I mean, in this business, man, I've been in a place before and you charge them $400 for a four piece band. Right. And they was cats that come behind you after you book it and say, Hey, I'll do it for two fifty. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. And then they'll call you and say, well, we double booked. You know, that's the, that's the, uh, that, that, that's the stupid bar owner. We double booked. But, you get what you pay for. Right. And, and at the same time, this is where I want to uh, uh, come up with. There, there's there got to be something that's that's more honest than that, man. There's got to be a system where a bar owners can look at a website or uh, bands can look at a website and say, I want to play this piece. I know this bar uh, books from four to six hundred mm-hmm. Or I know this band books from four to six hundred, and they'll be good for me. Instead of like I've tried to book bands, and the bands be like, "Don't tell them how much we book for because they might pay us more." Really? And the bars is like, "Don't tell them how much we pay because we might can get them cheaper." And I'm like, "Dude, <laughs> this is it's why wouldn't you even be honest about like your your prices in in the uh, the entertainment that you provide. I've always been open and honest about it myself. But wouldn't that be kind of borderline, like union type? It shit? would. You're talking, yes. about there? You're talking about like a union for musicians. Well, yeah. You, yeah, but the thing is, is like tell a telephone, tell a woman, tell a musician, it'll never work because <laughs> as much as let me tell you something, man. And I'm gonna be, and I'll tell anybody this: this business is cutthroat. You're swimming with sharks, and at the end of the day. If we sit in here and we all musicians and there's a, you know, now I'm, I'm going to be, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm like this. If there's a hundred dollars sitting on that table and we got a four piece band and they say, Hey, y'all can have this hundred dollars. Y'all play for an hour. I'll take the f- other motherfuckers around there and we make $20 a piece. You know, that's our pay. And there's some say, well, I'll just go get my acoustic guitar and I'll do that for you for a hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, as far as a bar on, you know what? I mean, here's a prime example. You're talking about the bar owners. Saying or a bar owner telling you, uh, you know, don't tell the band, uh, you know, or, or the band saying don't tell. That's stupid. You know, be open and honest about it. I'm going to tell you right now, dog, I ain't going to play my guitar on stage in a smoky bar room or pretty much anywhere without a $150 guarantee. Damn. Right. You know, 
And, and I've earned that. And what pisses me off sometimes is you got these cats that come up with the karaoke thing and somebody said, hey, you can sing good. You should be on American Idol. Well, instead of going to get American Idol, they decide to start a, a band because that's the cool thing to do. <laughs> and they making the same amount of money that I'm making. No, that ain't cool with me. That, that ain't cool with me. Now, I mean, maybe we differ from there, but I believe that in this business, you have to pay your dues. I paid mine. There's been gigs where I didn't get paid shit, and I unloaded the trailer. I loaded the trailer. Hell, I booked a gig. I got up there and sang 50% of the songs. I didn't get paid because I was told from the very beginning, you're here. We don't want to hear no shit from you. We hear any shit from you. You're very replaceable. And, you know, that's... But that's, you made the money. I didn't make any money I like then. It. No, you made the money. I made the money for the band, yes. certainly. Yes. 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 But the thing is, it's just like, let me tell you something. Russell Walker and, and him and I have have a lot of differences on a lot of things, and, and we've we've been back and forth many times. But with that said, um, you know, I believe that if you want to be in the music business, now this is for cover bands. It, it, fuck YouTube. Get off of YouTube. You know, quit quit going to the karaoke bars and, and singing karaoke. Uh, go join up with a band that's already established, like Russell Walker, or or, or uh, fuck, come join us. I, and pack pack the guitar cases, pack my guitar case around for free, and I'm gonna let you sing a song. That's gonna be your pay. That you're gonna get exposure and experience, and you're gonna learn what to do and what not to do. There's been nights when I left a club after being with the Russell Walker band for the first, the very first time I was with them, which I was very young. Now I'm not gonna say them boys didn't take care of me. They did take care of me. They watched out for me. But they wasn't paying me, and I didn't ask because I was just happy to be a part of the fucking team because I was learning something. Same thing, and you talk about the Barnes, Ronnie Barnes. Ronnie Barnes used to be Mr. G's in Hammond. I don't know if you remember that place or not. Yeah. Okay, Ronnie Barnes had a four, had a, a house job there. Nobody knew how much he was making. Hell, I, I maybe some of the guys in the band that he had in there, maybe they cared. You played there on a Wednesday and Thursday, you made $35. Friday and Saturday, you made 50 All right, when they fired him, and they got his nephew to come play in his place. And, you know, and I was playing with Ronnie. I, you know, he put me in the band. I was in the band there making $35 on Wednesday and Thursday. Friday and Saturday made $50. I thought I was shitting in high cotton, Jack. I mean, I was making money playing music. What? You serious? Yes. And then at the end, of the, you know, <clears throat> find out he's making $1,300. He was charging him $1,300. You know? He, it, did nobody bitched? Here we come with a three-piece band. Yeah, it's a business. No, well, maybe the other people, I didn't, bitch. Now, maybe there <laughs> was some in there that did. Now, I'm not going to say that, but yeah. I mean, now me, I'm more open. I mean, I ain't trying to screw nobody. I want my $150. Well, here's the thing. I think, well, you know, and I'm no musician by any means, but as long as you know what you're making going into the gig and you get that at the end of the night, it doesn't matter what anybody else makes. Right. You agreed to do the job for a set price, and as long as you get what you were you were promised... You can't, bitch. Let me ask you something. <clears throat> Turn the mic around so I can hear you. My mic. Ask swinging. away, Jack. <laughs> I'll regret this swinging. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. You shouldn't bite. Will tell him made on the show. Huh? Oh, it's all good, brother. <clears throat> He's got the power to edit. <laughs> <laughs> We're an hour and 22 minutes in. I ain't editing that whole thing. <laughs> but go ahead. These, uh, these... These bars that hire bands and uh, the gigs around here as as a, a cover band, how do you go about getting those? And it, is there any tips that you might want to give uh, to younger cover bands that's coming up that's maybe just starting about how they can get in the, in, into the clubs around here and what will sustain them there where that they – can come back and 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 play at these uh, little honky tonks around here and stuff. Well, it's funny you ask that because I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Boof and Boopaloo's the other night, and we were talking <laughs> really? about that. Yes, yes, I did. And um, first and foremost, the first thing you gotta remember is you're a fucking cover band. If you were anything more than a cover band, you wouldn't be playing Boopaloo's. You'd be on tour or on the road or in Nashville or, or wherever they think they're going to make it at. Uh, you're, you're a cover band. Now, you don't want to do it for nothing, and you don't want to underprice it to where you're going to hurt the other bands. But you want to, I mean, you know, like I said, I won't go for no less than $150, okay? And that's just for me. Uh, but 
you know, some bands go in there and they want $1,000. I need $1,000 to play here. Well, first and foremost, my first question is bar owner. Do you have a, what kind of crowd are you going to bring me in? Because you're going to, are you are guaranteeing you me, me a crowd, Jack? How much money are we going to sell in alcohol? Right. right. Now, if you ain't going to bring nobody in here, I'm, I'm you're going to play there one time, make that money, and that's going to be it. Now, like I said, keep in mind your cover band. Secondly, keep in mind that the bar owner ain't working for you. Correct. You're working for the bar owner. Okay. Correct. So if I was playing for Boo and I walked in and Boo said, hey, I want you to play about five yo uh, polka songs tonight, or, or, or five, you know. Don't disrespect. Or if he says, "Hey, turn down," don't say, "Hey, man, fuck you. You're not a you're not a sound man." Well, no shit, he ain't a sound man. But he can't if he's got to talk loud and talk over everybody, then you're too loud. There's a reason why he's asking that. You're running people out. They're paying you for a reason to be there. They're paying you for your services, and just like that bar, uh, the bartender behind the bar, you're all working together. If you're pushing drinks while you're on stage, when you say, "Hey," Uh, tip the bartender, you know, uh, you're helping her in return. She's going to help you, man. I mean, whether it be uh, slinging you a shot here or there or, or, or telling people about you or whatever. And, and honestly, that's kind of what got me over. You go watch some bands. They don't say shit about the bar owners or the bartenders that's working in the club. I mean, they, you're on the same level. You're not above them. Matter of fact, they're a little bit above you because, I mean, you got some shit with the bartender. Who do yeah, you think who's going to get rid of? <laughs> they have more Me food. or Nene? Who's going? <laughs> I guarantee you Nene going to be there next week. That's right. You know, um, it's a business, man, and you keep it, you keep a level head. That's how everybody can overcome this other, you know, the, 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 the I guess, uh, uh, price gouging or, or undercutting other ones. Or, but do you think that you should be honest? Uh, you damn right you should be honest. Why shouldn't you be? Yeah. But um, that's how I feel about it. The same way, like you should be honest about uh to the bar owner what you're gonna play and 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 to your 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 band about what you're gonna play. Um, uh, I cover bands that I've been seeing around here. It's like they're real sketchy about you know should we play this or should we play that or how much should we charge or how, and I, I'm just getting in to the the music business on the band side and uh with the 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 rap or the R and B I found it, it to be a whole different set of problems. But on the band it's like they don't wanna tell how much they're gonna charge or talk about how much they wanna charge for different amounts of monies or or, or I got no problem. Yeah. Now the bar owner may not want you to tell them. Yeah. But I mean, hey well, fuck I mean what do I I mean, you gonna fire me? You're not going to book me anymore? You know, Rex McDaniel, got the Rex McDaniel band. That's, he had text me sometimes. Hey, how much you make, you know, at so-and-so, or at this bar? And hell, I'm honest with him. You know, the same thing with anybody. I'm honest with any of them. I, I don't say, oh, I mean, we're making $500, or we're making, you know, we're making 1000 there, or I can't tell you. I don't give a damn. I'll tell you how much I'm making. Um, I'll be honest with them, you know. Yeah, that's just where I'm having I'm having uh, one of my problems at in in the business, and I wanted to ask you about that um, because I found that to be a little bit sketchy. I, I found it to be a little bit sketchy on the 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 rap side and the band side about like people not oh I don't want this much to for this uh, show or I don't want to charge this much for this show or whatever. So I just want to ask you about that. Uh, well, this might sound stupid, and this might sound stupid to some people out there, but I, I don't know. I mean. You can ask her. I'll book. I'll book gigs. Uh, Tony Gyro, for instance, and and also uh, me and Steve Haney do the two piece thing every other Thursday at uh, our place. Tony Gyro, he sends me a date. He'll send me a date first couple times I played with him. For him, we never negotiated a fucking price. The same thing with our play. We never negotiated a price. But they keep you busy. At the end of the night, I go in there. And there's other benefits. For and I'm done. They come up and they ask me how much I owe you. Come on. If you don't believe me, ask her. <laughs> yep. How much I owe you? So they give you the option. Now, see, that's that's pretty damn good business. That's a that's a win win for each for each place. You know what I'm saying? And and that's the way that music the music <clears throat> business should be. And I feel like it should be win win for everybody. But I don't see that a lot. I don't see that from and and I look from a neutral position, like I said, from the hip hop side all the way to the band side. And I'm, the only reason that I'm asking you about this stuff is because I'm trying to learn about it. I understand. Stuff. Uh, 
uh, I, I don't know about exactly how it works. I don't know about how you go to to bars or to venues and get these jobs. I don't know about how even you eat, ask for pricing or uh, what type of genre that you're doing that you should even ask for prices about that. And that's what I'm trying to learn in my business now and, and trying to spread the word to other people is that if a band comes and it's like, hey, Taylor, how do I get in this bar? I can tell them or I can say you can go to this and, and, and look at them. Or if a, a hip hop artist comes and says, man, where can I get shows at? What bars offer shows? Or I want to be able to, right, to right. be that glue to them. Well, there's, I mean, there, now that's a little different. Um, I was just going to say that, like, um, going out and, and viewing other people at these venues they want to get into, you, you know, if they're known or, um, I don't know how it is in the in the rap or whatever, but I know if Russell walks into a bar and that he's not playing at and another band recognizes him, They'll ask him to come sit in and play a couple songs, mm. you know, that, and yeah, that's that how he can get recognized in that venue and ho- and then potentially get booked in that venue. That's but, a great idea. Yeah. And also to the musician on the musician side to it, if they offer to play a song, if they offer, that's one thing. A lot of times if they offer me to get up and play, I don't. I'm there to listen. You're at that point, though, where you don't have to. I, I really never have unless uh, as far as getting up and and, you know, trying to get up and play with the band. You know, the the most disrespectful thing you can do to somebody that's up there playing a job, because it's a job. Somebody up there playing a gig is walk up and say, hey, can I sit in? Mm. Ask me that. I see you that. Yeah. Ask me. Yeah, but if they ask you, that's a whole different. Yeah, you're not fucking getting up here with me. <laughs> right. If they invite you up there, that's, that's a, a whole different code. thing. There's yeah. a fucking code to follow. I mean, you don't, that's a dis- that's disrespectful. I was 15, and I hope Mama's not listening, but I was 15, 16 years old, man. I would go to somewhere else in Hammond, and they had little Ronnie Barnes and, and, and Daryl Blunt, and they, I forget who was playing bass, but they had a three-piece play in there. I would sit in the corner and watch and listen. And finally, I worked up the nerve to walk up there and introduce myself to them. And, and, and you know, after talking to... After talking to him for a little while and showing up and just they watching me listen and finally Daryl, hey man, do you play something? Because you you know either that or something. I mean, you staring at me, and you're talking <laughs> about something, you know. And I say, yes, sir. I'm trying to learn. And nobody told me that. That's just that was just me. I was being honest. And he said, well, hell, get on up here and play. Well, I feel like that's a uh, one of the best the best ways to to get into what what you want to know is like even me sitting here asking you questions that I don't know about. I can admit that I don't know about those things, so I want to uh, to learn about them, and that's that's what I want to uh, start bringing to to right. people around here. Is I want to a- tell people, hey, ask these questions and figure out let's how how to do this together, instead of people act like it is a it's a secret to do everything. Be it's humble. Not, it's lose the arrogance. Yeah, yeah. It's not. I mean, you're gonna play. You know, dude. Let me tell you. In in. <laughs> This is crazy. I, I don't talk about this shit. I mean, her and I, we 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 dish all the time. But I, I'm, I've never talked about this, you know, publicly. I guess. But um, in this in in music business in general, whether you're a cover band or whether you're a, a international act, the first thing you need to learn is how to be comfortable. You know, first, well, you need to have the nerve to, you know, to be comfortable in the penthouse. But you. And and in the gutter, you know. I, I've been to shows uh, playing. I've played in front of three thousand people, and, and had every one of them with their fucking hands in the air, waving back and forth. You know, I did that. Every one of these motherfuckers eating a pile, off the palm of my hand, and then the next day, go to the ditch and play to three <laughs> chairs and the bartender. Right. And that's so you just got you got to be just as comfortable in the gutter as you are in the penthouse. You know, I've dusty roads wrestling. It said it the best, you know, he wine and dine with kings and queens, and then you got to sleep in alleys and eat and pork, pork and beans. beans. And that's the damn truth. And I, I've seen artists uh, even come to shows and would leave shows because they didn't have enough people to perform. Well, that's stupid. That's re- that's retarded, yes. That's stupid. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, if they tell me, hey, look, there ain't nobody here, man. Look, you, you take this much money. Sure. <laughs> so I'll go back home. I mean, we're going to stop and get a gallon of ice cream and come back and watch TV, <laughs> you know. That's right. That's right. But, uh. 
No, it's not a secret. It shouldn't be a secret. Everybody should work together. If you work together, everybody works, everybody eats. Everybody wins. And everybody wins. That's right. Uh, you know, like I said, don't <laughs> And again, if, I'm not trying to take up for bar owners and shit like that. I mean, there's some people I won't. I just I can't uh, pay uh, feasible. It ain't feasible going to a club and they they're gonna pay. Well, I'm gonna guarantee you three hundred dollars, and then uh, you don't make no money for the it. rest of the is it. You gotta work with on you know the rest of the money is gonna be from the door. I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> I'm I, I don't guarantee. I'm not guaranteeing you a crowd in here. I don't guarantee you a crowd in here. Uh, no. I can't do that. So if I was a band, I was a young band coming up, and uh, I was going to, let's just say, the Ditch Bar because you brought them up. Um, no disrespect I, to the Ditch Bar, no, by the way. No disrespect to the Ditch Bar. Just, <laughs> it was just brought up in conversation. Um, how do I get that uh, that that job there? Um, you know, do I say, hey, this is how much I charge, or what are y'all looking to pay for, or I, I, how would I? To be respectful. Well, if you're just getting in the in the business, I don't expect to be fucking paid. Really? No. It, it, you know what? My first, my fucking my first twenty gigs, I didn't make shit. You don't think if you're coming there with a, a, a band to entertain for that night that you should get paid for that night? Well, if you're just starting out, no. If you if you if you if you just got a band together and you, you learn how to play guitar two years ago or a year ago or six months ago, uh -huh. and you want to learn how to get in and how to be, no, <laughs> no, you, you, you tell them, yeah. tell them, yeah, I didn't, I mean, so even, even with hip hop artists, uh, you, you just coming up, you come in the bar, a bar lets you play. Um, well, I mean, I don't know that aspect of it, you but know? it's the same thing, right? It's like, you don't have no name. You, you come up in a, if, unless you can tell the bar owner, honestly, that you're going to fill the place up with about 300 people and they're going to make a bunch of money. No. And, and I'm gonna. I, I need to make some money. No. No. Then okay. Play for a fifty dollar bar tab. I got you. I got you. you. Know? See, I'm just learning. That's why I'm asking questions. No, I mean, and, and don't get me wrong, man. And this is just my opinion. And, and, and honestly, there's no method to this madness. Now, some bars are different. Some of them want a uh, electronic press kit. That's why I say I like to hear you first. Yeah. If they offer you that, or if you can, I mean, if you can just walk in and say, "Hey, I need five hundred dollars," you know, <laughs> on my first gig, and they give it to you, great. You did great. Yeah. Now, if you come back and you ask Russell McLean, you know, hey, this is my first gig. We make five hundred dollars. I might slap you in the fucking face. <laughs> I mean, and that's just some old school. That's old school, man. That's that's not, you know, I, I'm sure that's not how things work. Or well, apparently, naturally, it's not. But um, you know, that's just that's my outlook on it. I mean, you you got to earn that. Yeah. I earned my spot on in front on stage. I've earned my spot to be on the side as a lead guitar player. Is, I've earned that that where people can talk and say that boy can sing, you know. And to be honest with you, that shit gets aggravating. I mean, no disrespect to nobody. I mean, I don't look at nobody and say I, that's my fan. I got fans. I don't have fans because at the end of the night, we all gonna get in our fucking hoopties and we're gonna go to drive to down the same road. Yeah, but there is people, regardless of how humble you want to be, there is people out there, man, that really respects your, your guitar player. Well, yeah, I mean, ways. don't get me wrong, I respect that, too. Yeah. And, and and it's just, you know, I don't know, I come from a, a, a I mean, yeah, praise is great, but, you know, I, I'm your friend. I understand that, too. That's how, how do you badass kids do it? Let's talk <laughs> yeah, about that. Right. <laughs> you know, you telling me... Bad I'm good, bad and uh, you know you're great. You're great. That's fine. You tell me one time, man. You're awesome. Thank you, sir. I'm gonna tell you, thank you. Now some people just don't understand it. No, really, you're awesome. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, for real, man. And it's like I don't understand. Like motherfucker. Uh, well, dude. <laughs> I've been I'm trying to stop cussing all night. He's I, like, <laughs> well, it, it, we're explicit. We're explicit. <laughs> but I'm like, dude. I know. Okay. I'm not. I don't mean to sound. Like a asshole, but hey, man, you just I gotta know. you have to really take that with, with blessing because people give compliments. It is a blessing. The people give compliments uh, so rarely now these days, and that, that that's just a great thing. I do appreciate it. I yeah. just you know tell me one time. <laughs> <laughs> or send me a twenty in a tip jar. Yeah, yeah, Same put thing. the twenty in a tip jar. You want to tell me? Yeah, you want to tell me how good my album is? Buy two. The music business <laughs> changes every six. It used to change every six months. Now it changes probably every two weeks. 
Um, there's bands out there now that pop up that I don't even know who the hell they are. I don't know these people. And, and, and more power to them. You know, I can't stop them. But, you know, and you, you talk about being humble and everything. I'm very, very humble. But you take that fella that walks in there that wants to get arrogant or that gets arrogant. I can pick up on that shit like that, Jack. Oh, yeah. Quick. I can smell it. And you know, I smile. And I don't say I don't get out of line with them or nothing. And that's the one I do invite on stage. Come on up here and help me sing this song. You know, or, let them make an ass out of or, or, or <laughs> let them, or let them get up there and try to, you know, they, they act like I've only played, been playing for fucking a year. You know, want to tell me some shit. I am like, oh, okay, all right, cool, that's awesome. And then I'll rear up on your ass and make you look stupid. <laughs> now, I, I did. I confidence. I, I stay humble. I, you don't see a lot of confidence, but as far as, um, uh. Faith in my ability, don't think I don't know what I can and can't do. I don't ever put myself in a situation where I'm going to look like a fool. And if you put yourself in that situation to try to make me look like a fool, I'm going to humble your ass. And, and But, I mean, I think as musicians, as guitar players, I think we've all went through that. Um, there was a time whenever you actually learned how to play, you know, Pride and Joy by Stevie Ray Vaughan, and you wanted to show everybody that you could play lead. You jumped up there and played it. But what you didn't realize was you have 30 fucking songs, and you know, or are you playing 60 songs at night in three sets, and you can't play the Pride and Joy lead to every song you play? <laughs> you know, so then that you, you have to humble yourself. You've got to go home, and you've got to learn your, your, your craft, learn your trade. You know, you get out there and thinking you're, you're, you're hot shit. I guarantee you, there's somebody out there going to hunt you. Amadei Frederick, uh, the Creole man, told me. I mean, he knew. Those guys knew. You know. It, it comes a point in time whenever... You know, as far as the first band I was in, my head was hitting the ceiling. Uh, you know, I, I'm not that I was better than they were, but I had I, I had taken it to a, a a different level than what they were on. Okay, uh, and and a real musician will see that, and they'll tell you, you know, it's time, bro. You got to go out, and that's I remember having that conversation with Amadei Frederick's dad, a uh, Creole man, and and then we were sitting outside, and he said, Russell, you, you know. You need to get away from the Ronger, and you need to get away. <laughs> right. And uh, I understand your friends, y- y- y'all friends you have, but you need to go out and experience some things. You come back in a few years, you're going to be a different player. But if you ever get the big head while you out there exploring, I'm going to hunt your ass down, and I'm going to cut your head off. Well, uh, the music, man, is, is from my perspective, has been – obvious how, uh, how you come up and and <clears throat> and did your thing in it but how did this podcast stuff come along i mean what trying to do what you're doing trying to do what i'm doing trying to stop people from coming in and eating off of my plate trying to stop people from killing the business and then uh, after i guess i don't know three to six months into doing and it is me and mud tooth doing the sounds of louisiana thing I, I I had a I'd come to the realization that it didn't matter how hard you fought or how much you bitched or how much you pushed, they will always be that person that will cut your throat. Right. So I had to veer. I went in a different direction. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't know where the fuck this thing was going. Um, you know, sometimes I I remember the first few interviews I did, and it was just like tonight when I talked with uh, we we talked with Nasara. They was with uh, the first. I think it was like actors. I, I did like actors for like six months. Fuck, I don't even watch TV. <laughs> and, and I'm talking to these people about their careers and the acting. I didn't know the fucking uh, whatever. You know, it was cool. It got people started listening. Um, but and then I got a, I got. I started networking, which I'm going to give a lot of credit to Tanya because, look, I'm a I'm a very uh, a private person. I, I get in, I, I can isolate myself from the world, man. I can cut the world off in a New York minute, and it don't bother me at all. Uh, Tanya kind of pushed me and got me out of my shell as far as being more uh, sociable and, and networking. And <clears throat> it, don't get me wrong. I mean, I can I can talk. And next thing you know, we're sitting here, and I'm, I'm interviewing. I think the very first interview was Ronnie McDowell. Well, no, the very first one was Wayne Toops, correct? Really? And, man, I'm sitting there at the desk nervous as hell when he called. <laughs> and when we got done, I, I mean, I was I – mean, I remember getting up and, and let, letting the thing, you know, do its uh, – letting the recorder write the uh, the show. 
And uh, I walked to the back. I had tears in my eyes. I was scared to death. And, you know, it's a fucking Wayne Toops. A lot of people don't think it's a big deal. I yeah, talked to it's him. Yeah, Wayne Toops. And then the next one was Ronnie McDowell. And, you know, him and I, I mean, we had a conversation. And then T. Graham Brown. And it just. Really? It's been that, that recent? Uh, I've been doing this. I, we launched Sounds of Louisiana March 13th, March 7th, 2013. Ago. I launched Radio Random Network July. I want to say it was June. It was either the 11th, 14th. Is it the 14th? July 14th of 2014. I launched Radio Random Network because I wanted to grow. You know, I wanted to see what, what else was out there. Yeah. Um, well, so, man, I, I just believe that you've done great. Uh, it, it's really, it's really. Um, humbling to sit back and see um, how you do things, and to know that that you you talk to the people that you do. Now, um, when I was growing up, I, I I've heard a bunch of the names that that you interview, and it, it's cool for me to sit back and listen to them and see where they are today and what they've done. Even though that's not the type of uh, m- music that I listen to, but the reason that I wanted to talk to you today, really is uh, to shed more light on, on yourself as the, the host of uh, RadioRandomNetwork.com. Well, I mean, and it's a... And, and, and do, do a little something for, uh, for people to listen to, uh, to give a, a background on you, man, because uh, you shed so light on, uh, so much light on uh, other people, and it's, it's uh, when I'm listening to it, and I listen to all of your, uh, your podcasts there, is, is that, I'm like, why don't these people know about him? You know what I'm they saying? They do. They do? Yes, they do. Well, that wasn't something as a new user that, that I knew about. And that Hell was yeah, they do. That, that I wanted to I'm not bragging, about. but yeah. yeah. Everybody, let me tell you something, Will. I have a black book over here. <laughs> and it's got some numbers and it's got some addresses that I could, that there's people that I've played with that was Nashville recording artists. They would kill for that black book, man. I'm not bragging. I'm telling the truth. Uh, I didn't, I mean, dude, I mean, I'm just me. Uh, um, when they call, I make it personal. I want to talk to them. I want to have a conversation with these fucking people. That's what I do. And it first started out. I remember getting excited and almost pissing on myself because they would say my name, man. You know, they, we would start the interview and they'd say, well, Russell, let me tell you, you know, I was like, he said, well, now, uh, you know, and then it, it starts with, uh, you know, and I can tell you every interview I've ever done because every one of them, there's a certain, there's a certain part of it that it was memorable for me. Um, sitting there talking to, to Roy Clark. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Roy Clark. Yeah, I know who Roy Clark is. Well, for those that aren't, Roy Clark is the original a fucking guitar hero, man. You couldn't get bigger than Roy Clark. Roy Clark can play anything. And sitting there talking to him about music, and then all of a sudden, out of his mouth, he says, you know, he starts talking about the notes on the guitar, and, you know, he said, thought there was only so much I can do, but you know all about that, Russell. You're, you're a musician. What? What did you just say? <laughs> Wait, how do you know? <laughs> what? You know? And, and then, you know, talking to... <laughs> You know, T. Graham Brown, who was, God, he was one of my favorites. And, and you know, him, at the end of the conversation, you know, when, when I guess I should have had to record her own, but he was, you know, him telling me about how he could, you know, giving me advice you know, on, on music and, and, and writing songs and writing jingles. People fucking pay for that, Jack. And then, um, you know, I didn't expect it, but uh, the first time I talked to him, T.G. Shepard. Who is a major star? He's huge, man. Uh, matter of fact, he's going to be on the uh, cover of uh, Country Weekly, Nashville Weekly, the big music, country music magazine next month. But talking with him, and then the, the first time I talked to him, he was cool. He was in the car. He was bringing his wife to the airport or dropping her off. I don't remember. Yeah. He was in a hurry. And I respect these people's time. Um, whenever uh, the next time I talked to him, getting off the phone with him, and he, you know, he says, Russell, I just wanted to tell you, you're one of the best in the business. I heard that interview. And I, yeah. well, the first time he said it, I said, wait a minute. And I turned around and I hit the record button. I said, say it again. Yeah, you said it at the end of the interview. <laughs> he was like, this, <clears throat> but what, not to brag, but uh, what, what, oh, boy, I said I was the, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, that, hey, 
I, I thought about the, the day I was actually down cleaning some toilets where you know <laughs> where where my business is, and I was like, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get on the 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 podcast tonight. And you know, one of the things I thought about was like he old boy said that Russell, he's like, man, you're good, you're good at what you do, mm-hmm. and and I I really appreciate that. I uh, that was one of the things I thought about over and over again. That made me nervous about coming here tonight, yes. just because he said that. It's just, it's just, it's psychology. It's everything has a method. Everything has a formula. And in in life, as a human, if you want to do something, you got to figure out that formula to break that. I guess that the code or or however you want to. I don't really know the. I guess the verbiage to to really explain it, but. You got to figure it out, and you and you got to figure it out on your own. Um, but I think music is something that comes naturally to Russell. He knows the history behind everything. That's why when he's talking to these people, he has a conversation with them. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, a lot of times whenever he gets the interview request, he'll get talking points, things that they want to promote or whatever, and he'll hit on those points. But he can go into details because he knows the history behind this. It, music is his. It's his life, his business, well, that and wrestling. Yeah, but, there, you know. there's nothing more genuine than the pure conversation. If you and if you can pick up on something that that you can talk about, there, there's nothing better than that. And uh, that's something that Russell does real good. And uh, I, I think that's why I pre- people are, are appreciate that his show. But if you, uh, well, I want to say the turning point for the whole thing. I'm, I'm turning into a uh, Joel Sonia here, but uh, the turning point of the whole thing was with. Uh, you know, with Richard Young of the Kentucky Headhunters, he called in. It was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, he's done probably did about 100 fucking interviews that day. You know, <laughs> and you can tell in their voice, man, they're yeah. tired. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hey, man, what's going on? And real, I mean, he was cool. And he busted out talking. I didn't get to, I couldn't say anything. And then he started talking about, uh, um, you know, uh, hell, hell, rock and roll, uh, the Chuck Berry thing with Keith Richards and all that, and then I, I struck on that. And I said, "Yeah, I remember that's when Keith Richards punched uh, Chuck Berry punched uh, Keith Richards in the eye." <laughs> and when I said that, he's like, "What? Like, you know, how the hell do you know that?" And that was the uh, that was the turning point. He he did a big thing on Facebook. I yeah, mean, that's when it goes from interviews to conversation, right? You know, and and that's where where the real meat. Uh, comes from man. That's but for him, I mean, he he turned around and said, "Man, it was, it was great." <laughs> Finally, talking to a, 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 a somebody that's interviewing me that actually knew it about knows. music. Yeah, you yeah. know. But uh, any more questions? I don't think so, man. I appreciate you for letting <laughs> me come sit down tonight. I really enjoyed myself. It ain't no problem, brother. It is just this is just a thing. That's all it is. It's all just a thing. <laughs> Same thing with music. Uh, I remember somebody asked him about getting nervous going on stage i don't i used to sometimes i will get butterflies i guess i'm answering and asking my own questions now <laughs> but, um, to wrap it up. yeah know. about that time <laughs> um that's right well yeah we're about four about six minutes from the two hour mark God, really? so yeah it's all good i'll edit it down real <laughs> yeah, good you but, put that down about 15 minutes Mm. <laughs> With all of that said, like, share, subscribe, visit RadioRandomNetwork.com for all the information about Radio Random Network and our weekly shows. we got the real estate lady, Tanya Halford. She's going to be coming out with our own podcast in February. Uh, got some big things happening in March. Sign up for the newsletter. Find out all about that. Be sure and like us on Facebook and Twitter. All links and everything talked about on today's show can be found in the show notes at RadioRandomNetwork.com. Uh, with that said, Will, you have the website. You have a website too. You want to plug it, man? Yeah, yeah. My website is uh, www.visionbywtm. That's Will Taylor made visionbywtm.com. And you can find me at visionbywtm on Twitter or at Facebook. That's awesome. Tanya, you want to, want to plug your stuff there? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I'm hashtag RDM Russell Devin McLean. We'd return next week with the one and only Mud Tooth right here on the Russell and Mud Tooth Show. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to our sponsors. Shout out to everybody that's tweeted and listening to the show. We'll see you. Well, we'll talk to you next week. Bring me back next week. I got to talk to Mud Tooth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Later. Thanks for listening. Same time, same place next week. 
you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. 